country that is held together by various tensions, tensions between sects, between ethnicities. This intervention, he said, is going to destroy Iraq. It is going to plunge it into civil war. And though it didn't happen at that time, it happened at the time of the second Gulf War, 2003. Earlier, he had warned the Americans, those who you are aiding in Afghanistan will one day turn against you. He's a man, so Iqbal met Osama bin Laden in 1986. He interviewed bin Laden and he immediately drew the conclusion that a terrible war lay ahead. He was very close to the Palestinians and this was 1982, he was, he had been involved with the Palestinians for a very long time. He warned them, he warned them. He said, you are taking on the military might of Israel. You will be destroyed. Don't take them on militarily. Take them on with those tools with which you can win. And so he advocated civil disobedience. He argued with Yasser Arafat on this. Yasser Arafat ignored him. Then followed the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And I was there in the United States at that time at the University of Washington in Seattle and then came briefly to New York as well. And this was the time when he was in the lowest state of depression. I've never seen him so depressed at that time. And this is when he had his first heart attack as well. He knew, he knew, he kept telling the Palestinians, don't do this, don't fire Katyusha rockets into Lebanon, into Israel from Lebanon. They will get you, and then they came. They came with their tanks, they crossed the border, they destroyed the city of Beirut. For days after days, we saw Israeli tanks bombarding, bombarding. Now I have to go back and tell you a little bit about Debbal. <laughs> he was born about uh, 14 or maybe 15 years before partition, and when he crossed, he was born in Bihar, in a village called Irki. His father had been murdered by a landlord. Iqbal, at a very early, very early age, developed a passion for justice. And when he crossed over from Bihar with his family, he saw the suffering that partition had caused. That feeling of injustice, was to stay with him all his life, that feeling that he must fight what is wrong in the world, that gave him a sense of direction. And so it's very early on that he went to Kashmir to fight what he saw was an injustice over there. He came back enriched, but that's, an, that's a time of his life that we know so little about. Then he went on to Princeton University. Well, he's, I'm sorry I'm missing out so much, I can't give you a full biography, but when he came back, he joined Foreman Christian College in Lahore, where I presently teach. And uh, he, from there, went on to Princeton University. He had gotten a scholarship for studying over there. He was to do his PhD in political science and he chose as his subject the labor movement in Algeria. So he went to Algeria and within no time he was with the FLN. And just think about this, that he's an outsider who doesn't even speak your language but is learning it. 
within a matter of months, he is considered one of them fighting against the French. And although I don't know if it is completely true or not, they say that he represented the FLN in the Paris peace talks a couple of years later. Then he went back to Princeton, he wrote his PhD. He, when he finished it, he got a job at Cornell University. And that is the time when he started, he started working with the Palestinians. He would write about it, he would speak about it, he would argue with his, with his colleagues at Princeton about it, as a consequence of which he was ostracized by them. They wouldn't, he would be sitting in the cafeteria by himself. The others wouldn't even come to speak to him. That's also the time that the Vietnam War was on. It was a third world people who had earlier been colonized by the French. And when the French were about to leave, then come the Americans and in the name of containing communism, they used the full arsenal of a modern developed superpower upon a people who had no defense against that. If Weil is credited together with Noam Chomsky, the Berrigan brothers, others as being the founders of the, of the anti-war movement in the United States. And so it was in 1971, when I was a student at MIT, that I first encountered Iqbal And I encountered him on two occasions. The first was a demonstration against the Vietnam War because he was on campuses all over. Just, an, just a year earlier, he had been accused by the government of the United States of attempting to blow up the heating system of the White House and the Pentagon, and of attempting to kidnap Henry Kissinger. <laughs> All three of them, weren't they? No, the, there were seven people. These were called the Chicago Seven. The Harrisburg Seven. And the, it, it was really Iqbal who had uh, suggested in a private meeting that uh, Henry Kissinger, who was the architect of the war in Vietnam, was someone that people should put under <coughs> citizen's arrest. That is, they should hear <laughs> It didn't happen. There was the CIA. The CIA got wind of it. They got, they then accused him of and, and the other six who were present. This became a long, drawn out civil rights case in the United States. It actually it turned out to be something that galvanized the, the public. It became something very prominent and was uh, where the anti war movement started from. So I heard him speaking on that. And when I heard him, I, this was the first time that I had seen, I had heard a speaker who was so dynamic, so powerful, who could just, just have the crowds mesmerized. I heard him on a second occasion, and that was when he was speaking about East Pakistan. This was a time when, this was when the war had started. Civil war in East Pakistan had started. The Pakistan army was carrying out massive campaigns against the Bengalis. There was murder en masse. 
rapes, and then there was a Mufti Bahini also. The majority of Pakistanis in the United States at that time were those from West Pakistan, and the majority were, of course, with the army and with the army action. Iqbal was straight swimming against the tide. Together with Firoz Ahmed and Ajaz Ahmed, they had started a publication, Progressive Pakistan, and I had I became one of their helpers. That was my introduction to him. But let me go on to tell you a little bit about the book, because this is an important book. There have been books earlier on, but they have been collections of Iqbal's writings. They have not <laughs> been, there's not been as yet a book that has been written on Iqbal. It's, I think, a book that has a considerable, considerable amount of material that uh, does not exist elsewhere. So, even after knowing that file since 1971, until the time that he died in 1999, there are many things that I learned from reading this. But let's look at the several aspects that this book brings out. The most fundamental thing about Iqbal is that he was a man whose natural sympathies lay with the underdog. Those who were exploited, those who were at the bottom of the chain. So his natural instinct was to be with those who were oppressed and who at that time were the ones who were fighting against imperialism. And that imperialism was US imperialism. Not only did he fight on the matter of Palestine, but also, on, as I said, on the Vietnam War. And yet he was not a blind anti-imperialist. So in 1990, when the Bosnian issue became very serious, where there was a massacre of Muslims in Bosnia, the left in the United States was split. There were very important voices then saying that the United States is intrinsically a force for the bad. And so it should stay away from Bosnia. Wherever the United States goes, it does nothing but harm. And in fact, this is the position that Noam Chomsky had taken. And Noam Chomsky was uh, to get uh, like uh, Noam Chomsky is to me and to lots of people in this room, an extremely important individual, a brilliant mind, a man who's said, who's, who's done an enormous amount for humanity. And yet, Iqbal couldn't go along with Chomsky. Iqbal wanted the United States to send arms to Bosnian Muslims. He could not countenance their massacre at the hands of the Serbians. And as we know, this is what happened. Yesterday was Kashmir Day. So I want to say a few words before I turn it over to those who have joined me over here. For the land of Tiari and Imran. Yes, Iqbal had gone to Kashmir, he had fought there. As I said, we don't know very much about it, but when he returned to the United States in 1990, he spent a lot of his time going to Kashmir, meeting with leaders over there, meeting with leaders in Pakistan and in India, wherever he could get access. Because he saw this as a tragic conflict, one that had already taken tens of thousands of lives. 
And he thought that Kashmir was an issue that could be solved. It could be solved under four conditions. First, that neither Pakistan nor India would seek to solve it militarily. Because all efforts to resolve this conflict with the force of arms had failed. We tried in 1947. We tried in 1965. And it didn't work. Secondly, he said that the need for compromise is paramount. Neither India nor Pakistan can achieve their maximalist desires. You have to give some, they have to give some. Third, you can't leave the Kashmiris out of it. It's got to be with the Kashmiris. So, he spent his time going from here to there he developed deep links with them that eventually it did not happen. It is, of course, because the forces of history are too big for individuals to work against. But he would bitterly remark that India and Pakistan are willing to fight to the last Kashmiri. <laughs> Yilpan was an advocate of specifically Muslim causes. The causes of Algeria fighting against the French. He saw that as a Muslim cause. He saw Palestine as a Muslim cause. He saw the case of the Baghdadis of East Pakistan as a Muslim cause. But when I say that he saw this as a Muslim cause, it was not because those who were suffering were Muslims, but because it was not because of their faith, but rather that the majority of those affected were Muslims. So to him, a Palestinian Christian or even a Palestinian Jew was the fact that that person had been evicted from his or her land was as hurtful as a Palestinian Muslim being evicted. So in that sense, he was a very secular man. He was not particularly an observant Muslim. I never saw him pray. His, he always had something nice to, for people to drink. <laughs> and yet he was a Muslim. Why was he a Muslim? Because he sided with the oppressed. And because he saw that Islam was much more than what was being represented by Muslims. He saw in Islam its great civilization, its art, its culture, its science. And it is this, deep, this rich tapestry that made Islam such a great civilization. So he respected Islam from his heart. I can say that. say that because it was to the very end that he said, I am a Muslim, to the very end. So he was a humanist and Muslim. How one can reconcile the two is, a, is unusual. It is the finest amalgamation of two principles that I have ever seen. And so when he left, as I said, the loss was too deep to bear. 
Thank you.